Oh, oh, we're live. Hey, hey, everybody. Thanks. Sorry. I've been counted in there and I was waiting for the number one. Great. So um, thanks, everyone. I think I have about 25 minutes. And this is my presentation called How Project Zoe is Opening Up the Mainframe. The Mainframe, this is um, a Linux conference, a Linux foundation, a lot of open source. It's probably a little bit weird to see mainframers pitching up here. Maybe people don't often think of the mainframe as an open platform. So. Um, I am just, uh, apologies if I don't operate this. Let me hit the next button. Cool, okay. So this picture of me, this picture of my family. I'm on the right, the left of the picture when you're looking at it anyway. Um, and uh, there's, my, there's my lovely family. Oh, the, the, the sort of teenager, the kind of 19 year old with the sort of, he's got more hair than me, um, or I used to when I was that age anyway. Um, that's my son, Jared. And, and like all parents who are teenagers, you know, I was a teenager once, so I know it's hard being a teenager and I have a, a teenage son, so uh, you know you have that kind of father teenage relationship where it's kind of a little bit standoffish. He's quite nocturnal, tends to sort of stay awake um, at night and sleep in the daytime and things like that. So, but there's uh, um, one one thing that he and I both enjoy. We both enjoy movies. We both enjoy superhero movies and uh, Japanese anime and so forth. And there's a fan fabulous movie. It came out in 2018. It's called Spider Man into the Spider Verse. If people haven't watched it, cracking film. Um, the basic backstory for the film. Somebody gets bitten by a spider, they turn into the Spider-Man. It's not your typical Spider-Man story. Um, it's actually, uh, I won't uh, reveal too much about it, but if you look at this particular scene here, the uh, Spider-Man, um, uh, you know, kid growing up, having to prove he's worthy of being the new Spider-Man, uh, that's actually him on the very left of this picture, as you're looking at it, it's called Miles Morales. He meets other spider people from other universes. Um, and there's a point in the movie, most movies have a, a bit called the hero's journey, where the hero has to challenge and prove that he's worthy to be, to be the hero in the movie anyway. So Miles Morales has been challenged by all these other spider people um, as to whether he's, he's, uh, he, he's able to, and he's got this sort of doubt within himself, and he's kind of in his basement of his auntie and stuff like that. And they're all throwing lines at them. There's a wonderful line that um, uh, Penny Parker, who's one of the spider people, throws at him. And um, I was watching this movie with my son and we were just sitting eating popcorn. You know, we hadn't mentioned pretty much a word to each other. And the line in the movie where they're all throwing challenges, they're saying, you know, can you jump through walls? Can you do backflips? Can you, you know, can you fight evil baddies in nine dimensions? They say, Penny Parker says, can you rewire a mainframe while being shot at? And I love that line because it kind of shows that, first of all, if you know anything about mainframes, you're worthy of being a superhero because they have this kind of mystique of being incredibly difficult, hard to operate. Um, and also I love it because my son at that point, he turned to me and he said, Dad, can you be our mainframe while being shot at? And I had this just for about five seconds, I had this really cool connection where he thought that I was kind of like a superhero because I worked on mainframes anyway. But it made me realize, it made me think, um, my son doesn't know a lot about mainframes. A lot of people don't know a lot about mainframes. So that kind of leads me into where, to, to where I thought I'd kick off this talk. Uh, so a little bit of uh, some mainframe trivia here. Uh, I won't repeat it all for you. I'm not here to sell you a mainframe. But the most interesting thing for me about mainframes, I personally work on mainframes and open source, um, is the bottom line. Most people working on a mainframe have never seen one. And that's true today. I meet people who work on mainframe computers and have worked on them for perhaps 30 years. I have fabulous careers and they're retiring, uh, some of them. And, uh, and I say to them, um, when was the last time you actually saw a mainframe? Apart from perhaps being in a trade show or you know, on a video or something, have you ever seen your company's mainframe? And the answer is no, they probably haven't. Or it's like the other side of the world, perhaps in a, you know, or even if it's in their office, it's in some data center in a basement or something anyway. So it's incredibly, it's a computing platform that's still quite unfamiliar with, uh, to us. We haven't often seen it. So for the next picture, um, the vision that a lot of people have of mainframe computers is kind of like the left-hand picture. It's sort of black, it's white, it's got tape decks. People see it through Hollywood movies. This is my son's perception of the mainframe and Penny Parker was of this kind of sort of superhero test platform. It's actually a fairly modern machine. It's a, it's a thing on the right-hand side. Um, sometimes the mainframe often people uh, say, oh, it's old. Yeah, it's old, it's been around for 55, 60 years. But Porsche 911 Targa, um, that's not an old car, it's been around for the same amount of time, okay? Um, my current car is actually an old car, it's actually, I just have a 12 year old car, but the automobile engine has been around for what, 100 years or something like that. So um, 
So when you when when technology started, obviously things move on. The world moves on. You know, engines get better. The Porsche 911 gets better, and the mainframe gets better. So, so one of the reasons that this kind of perception of age really comes from the fact that people haven't seen it. They haven't seen what the modern mainframe is like. The modern mainframe has a lot of open source running on it, and that's where I'll get to with this with talk project Zoe. A lot of people, when they see the mainframe, when they picture it, they picture this, which is a bunch of green screen, you know, a little bit of red and blue on here. It's a very sort of text-based interface. And to some people I know who work on the mainframe, this is actually what scares them away from it because it's obviously, it, it's not modern, it's not drag and drop, it doesn't have GUIs, it doesn't have help text, it doesn't have rich graphics and stuff like that. So sometimes people date it based upon how it looks, okay? Which is very true as well, right? If you if you look at some, a building or or anything like that, or a piece of music or something, often you date it by by how it looks or how it sounds, okay? Doesn't internally mean that it's still, it's still an old system, okay? So one of the interesting things, my background when I grew up, I grew up kind of, I was kind of like a sort of 70s kid, you know, I graduated from university in about 1988. Um, and at the time, um, a little bit of animation on this slide, uh, folks, this is an uh, operating system called OS2, OS2 Warp. Um, OS2 Warp, and this is Windows 3.1 on the bottom right hand side. And even if mainframe is great technology, being great technology doesn't win. Often sucky technology and Windows 3.1 was sucky technology at the time. It was technically inferior. It wasn't 32-bit multitasking. It wasn't protected memory. It would crash, yada, yada, yada. It, it, it won the war, and it made Microsoft a phenomenal company that they are now. They're a huge company, and they're actually very active in open source as well. So I'm not attacking them as a company, but at the time, this was at the inferior platform one. And history is riddled with that. Even if you look at uh, TV shows right now, reality TV shows, you know, um, the people who come second or third uh, in singing talent shows often become, go on to become the, the best stars and often people don't remember, um, you know, perhaps a person who had the best voice or something. Um, sometimes technology really is a popularity contest. And the reason I believe at the time when I was I, 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 at university, I had a choice between using one of these two platforms. In my heart, I knew that OS2 was a superior platform. Um, but I tend, I became a Windows developer for actually for, for the first 12 years of my career. And one of the reasons was because as a developer, it was a very welcoming community. There was a lot I could do on Microsoft Windows. It had a, a developer program. There were lots of apps on it. It ran games. You know, I could, I could, you know, it was, it was a more welcoming and ultimately the number of games on the platform, the amount of software you've got is what makes your platform successful. And this story is as old as time. I've got a picture of VHS versus Betamax. It doesn't matter what generation you're in. I've got um, games consoles here. I've even got coffee pods on the right, right? The coffee pod, there's these coffee pod wars going right now between Nespresso or Keurig. I tend to, but, uh, you, I have an espresso coffee maker. I like to drink coffee. The coffee I like to drink comes in espresso pods. Ego, I buy an espresso coffee maker. People tell me it's not as good as the other one. I don't care. It makes the coffee I like. The games I like to play and the videos back in the 1980s, 1990s when I was watching videos I were available on VHS cassettes. So I had a VHS player. Okay. You've got to have the platform. You've got to have people building stuff for your tech for you to be successful. Okay, which brings me up to Linux Foundation. Most people here should know about Linux Foundation. It's a Linux Foundation um, or Open Source Summit conference. It runs a ton of very cool enterprise um, software that's ultimately open source, Jenkins Node. And we have the Zoe logo here in the bottom left of that kind of Northeast tile. Um, and Zoe is an open source project owned and managed by the Linux Foundation. A little bit of background, we have a Wikipedia page. Um, we're about um, just a little over two years old. Um, and if I look at the timeline, just coming up recently, we uh, created what is known as an active long-term support release. People who work on Node will be familiar with that. It means we're kind of stabilized and we're a little bit settled, which sort of happened in about March. And there was a press release just, I think, last week ago. So our first year of kind of growing up, you know, when we were in sort of diapers, kind of burping, um, you know, crawling around, really trying to get ready. That was last year. We added a lot of stuff in now, and now we're ready to be um, sort of enterprise. Um, I'm going to cover a, quite a bit of speed just because I only have about 25 minutes for this talk. Some of the key points about what we have within Zoe. Um, first thing, everybody to remember, I, I actually personally work for IBM. IBM pays my salary, but um, I work for IBM for Zoe, which is owned and managed by the Linux Foundation 
um, open mainframe project. It is an open source, um, open source, you know, collaboration. All of our meetings are open. Uh, we have elections to various um, groups called the Zoe Leadership Committee, which I'm fortunate to be part of. You know, we, we don't do things in private and secret. So as an IBMer, that feels quite odd sometimes because at IBM, we used to do lots of things kind of in private and secret um, before we announced it. That's not how things work with our open source. Uh, we create releases once a month with continuous integration. So if there's something that people don't like um, and they can engage with us on Slack and Git, look at all of our source code, join any meeting they want to, look at all of our issues, um, uh, we may have a fix within a month um, f for, for issues. So we tend to be quite nice continuous integration, continuous delivery. And I think our customers tend to like that. For something that they raise, uh, we f tend to fix it quite early on. First, we have a number of components. I'm going to rattle through them at quite a bit at speed. The first component we have is called the Zoe Explorer. The Zoe Explorer, for very, uh, folks who use VS Code, Visual Studio Code, um, it's a plugin for VS Code. And if you think back to my initial um, thing about, you know, sometimes people think the mainframe's old because it has this kind of, you know, very garish, jarring sort of green screen. Um, you, you can go into um, uh, VS Code, uh, you just go into the extensions, which is a little tab on the, on, on the bar on the left, click Zoe Explorer, download it and install it. And w fairly quickly within, you know, follow the instructions, you're looking at this. So rather than, that's slide 16, let me just go back, I'm gonna do a kind of, Double click. Yeah, it worked for me. Boom. This is this is your 55 year old mainframe. And there are still customers who, who, who operate the mainframe like this and enjoy it. But I work with folks who are, you know, actually uh, younger than my youngest son, right? Younger than my 19 year old. I was watching the, uh, the uh, Spider-Man movie with. Uh, they, they basically don't, don't want to use this, right? You know, every generation wants to use a tech that they grew up with, and especially if you spent three years in a Comsky course. Uh, learning uh, VS Code, and VS Code is great for Node, Git integration, phenomenal, phenomenal product. You know, this is a for more familiar environment, and you can actually achieve uh, the same level of functionality. You know, you can work with a file system, and you can submit jobs and do various so on and so forth things. This is a very important piece of Zoe, called the Zoe Explorer. Okay, um, I'm just going to fast. Yeah, it worked. But there are other plugins as well. Zoe is a community, so the Zoe Explorer has a plugin, there's a thing called the IBM Z Open Editor, there's something called HCL Tools. Thinking back to my analogy about VHS versus Betamax or the coffee pods, it's not good enough to just have like, a, you've got to have a thing that other people want to extend and expand. There's a specific squad within Zoe, it's just got created recently, which shows kind of how dynamic Zoe is, that's really about trying to create it. So there are plugins to the Zoe Explorer itself. So again, even though it's open source, it's not a closed box that only we manage the OMP manager, so you can plug in. Very successful. A little story I'm gonna tell, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, most of us are, you know, stuck at home, right, with a pandemic, and obviously, uh, you know, depending on where you are, following different sort of lockdown rules and stuff, so I'm at home at the moment. Um, one of the things about the uh, COVID-19 pandemic is that, uh, we've got animation on the slide, so it's really good. Um, for those of you that follow the news, if you're on Twitter or LinkedIn or, or just following a different sort of tech news uh, from um, uh, the mainframes and COBOL, which is a software language uh, for, for the mainframe, um, uh, there's a lot of pressure on um, US uh, systems running on the mainframe. Okay. And because of that pressure, and I think that there's a very, uh, that statistic, I'll just repeat that statistic. So March the 29th to April the 14th, that's a, seven weeks, that's a one week. The number of people filing unemployment in just New York has gone up by 2,700% since last year. And that's just a very, you know, anything we can do to help that, anything anybody can do to address that is obviously a very noble thing to do. Um, the uh, And one of the things I think it's, uh, we need, Phil Murphy, I think he was the um, governor of New York, New Jersey, I'm not quite sure what, basically said, we need COBOL developers. You know, our systems are under stress, our systems are under duress. Uh, you know, and there was this call to the community, and you can see the number of um, uh, job applications and interest for COBOL. I've got a little graph in the, what be the southeast corner of this uh, slide. So <laughs> I like to say also southeast, bottom right-hand corner. Um, so you can see a number of COBOL developers, massive demand for COBOL developers. And um, so I'm just gonna click forward. Uh, there was a training course that was created by uh, using the Zoe Explorer to try and teach people COBOL. 
And you can see a lot of headlines, and I'm just showing, I'm just showing a few up here. Look at the animation about Kribble being given the new life. And there are video courses now on uh, using learning Kobol. This is a particular one here given by my colleague called Jeff Bisty. Um, April the 14th was when the Kobol training course was released using the Zoe Explorer. And on the day it went out, it already had 52,000 views. And there's a picture of Jeff up here, and they have Kobol Fridays. Anyway, so one of the things I love about working on Zoe is the fact that when there's a need to do something, a need to create Kobol education very quickly, it was able to pivot with the Open Mainframe project and create videos and they have Kobol Fridays and it's all done using VS Code. So people who like using VS Code want to become Kobol developers, uh, transfer their skills across. It's just a great range of activity from YouTube to collaboration training courses and it's just a good news story I wanted to share with people. Okay, so let me get back on track. The Zoe command line interface, I'm gonna do a little bit of, now this is interesting. So. VS Code, nice, rich, gooey, twisty, click, edit, GitHub, push, you know, get pull, get like, fabulous, fabulous product. Hats off everybody who's worked on that. Another interesting thing about um, modern computing platforms is command line interfaces. So I use Git. I have GUIs for using Git, but I spend a lot of my time actually doing Git status and Git branch and Git checkout and Git push and Git fetch and Git merge and so forth. I tend to write things in a command line. It, right, I use a Mac, I use a shell. And it's quite interesting. I do the same with Docker, right? Yeah, I do the same with AWS, Amazon Web Services. So this is kind of lowest common denominator. If you can do things in text, it's good. First of all, it means you can just type them, but it also means you can script them and you can automate them and you can you, know, you can programmatically drive a computing interface. And there is something nice about a command line interface because if you, even if beneath your command line interface, you're actually talking across REST or you're doing HTTPS or something like that, you know, being able to submit, you know, do posts and puts and gets and deletes and, you know, pass JSON objects and stuff. That's a lot of boilerplate code. It's a lot easier to just crank it out in English. Now, one of the things that I like about the Zoe command line interface, so we have a thing called the Zoe command line interface. First of all, I should have done that. There's a fairly, very big, successful component in Zoe. And you download it the same way you would download it, you know, a Docker client or a Git client or something like that. You basically download our Zoe command line interface. It's built upon Node. You just type in the command Zoe. But what I like about it is it's, um, if I go, I'll, I'll just go back one more. If you look at when I typed in the command Zoe, it tells me everything I can do. So if I look on the bottom, it says config, plugins, profiles, you know, jobs, etc. And that there's something there called files. Now, if I don't know what to do about files. I just type Zoe files and it reveals just what I need to know when I need to know it. So I type Zoe files and it says, well, what do you want to do? And I can look at this and it says Zoe files list. And I'm like, cool. I want to list a file. And then I just type Zoe files list. Maybe I went a bit too far. So Zoe files, and hang on this platform. Boom, here we go. Zoe files list. And so what kind of file do you like to list? So the mainframe has multiple types of files. It has a Unix file system, another file system called data sets and things. It's a little bit older, but they're, both used, they're just used to store different types of data. Um, so Zoe files list, and then I type Zoe files list DS. And then it gives me some some examples, and I do, do files list DS, and I qualify it, and it gives me a list back. So very quickly, just rattling through, what's nice about the Zoe command line interface is you don't have to remember all the commands, right? You're not going to make a mistake. As you ask it, and as you type incomplete commands, it tells you what else you need to know. I used to work with somebody in, uh, who was a documentation, and they had a thing called progressive discovery. And it's, it feels very progressive. It feels a bit like I love Google. Chrome, Google is my go-to search engine because it, it, it you know it's, it's blank until I start typing things in. And when I start typing things in, it reveals information to me. I remember back in the day with other search engines and you went there and before you typed anything, it told you the weather where you were. And, you know, I told you, it was kind of like this sort of massive, you know, loads of information coming, flying out the screen at you. And I was like, I haven't even told you what I want to know yet. And you're telling me all this stuff. Maybe, you know, I hadn't asked to type the weather anyway. so. What I like about the Zoe command line interface is that it just tells you what you need to know when you want to know it. So, um, and a quick slide I'm gonna show you here. It's just, this is standard Unix shell script and it's very useful for automation. So again, um, if I know how to write shell script, um, there are samples, by the way, using the Zoe command line interface using other scripting languages as well, you know, like, um, then I can very easily type in a sort of fairly similar 
uh, type syntax and I can operate the mainframe and I haven't got near a green screen. I haven't had to learn, you know, all this great green screen technology. I'm just writing a command line interface. Okay. And a few other things I want to very quickly show. The command line interface is extensible. So you can build plugins for the command line interface. Think back to my initial thing about VHS versus Betamax or coffee pods. Uh, if nobody's filling your coffee pods, nobody's going to buy coffee makers, right? If you, if you can't make it, haven't got the movies. So there is a, a program, a conformance program, a bit like sort of ready for Zoe. You think about, um, you know, getting stuff into an app store so you can build plugins for Zoe. Another Zoe thing that's quite neat I want to talk about is that there's, this is a web desktop. And the web desktop sounds a bit like an oxymoron, but basically, if you have Zoe installed on your mainframe computer, you can just log on from a browser. You don't need any other client software installed. You don't need, you just need your browser. It works in Chrome or Firefox. This is me running it in Chrome in incognito mode. Um, and you can see it's got little series of um, apps at the bottom. There's about four little tiles. You can see I've got a 3270 emulator. If I want to, I can do that. Zoe's got modern interface, but it's not leaving behind other people. And I've also got a nice modern interface, so you can do file editing old. And the next slide I'm going to show you, it's extensible. These are just richer, a bit like when you first get a phone. A phone would have a few apps on it, perhaps a calculator, perhaps a web browser and a compass. But you can go to your phone app store and just get more stuff and download it. And again, with a conformance program backing, you can go to Zoe and you can get more apps on Zoe. Okay. And these are just samples of apps that you can get onto Zoe. Okay. So I'm just going to quickly wrap up. So Zoe is open source. Go to zoe.org. Um, it's all of our source code is on github.com slash Zoe. Uh, this is a picture of our artifactory repository, which is where we hold builds and our Jenkins pipeline. No passwords are needed to access that. Obviously, you need elevated permissions if you want to start doing things like manipulating the pipeline or, or, or you know, or, uh, you, you know, approving pull requests or so forth, or, you know, uploading to Artifactory. But you can have read access to anything that we have out there. Um, there's no um, secret source as well. We, this is our calendar. So you can join any meeting for any squad. Uh, this is our Slack. We have a Slack workspace, which is where people can interact with the community. And um, I'm just going to wrap up there, I think. If people have questions, by the way, um, then please go and I think there's a Q&A thing at the bottom and uh, you can ask a question. I'm just going to go there now to see if anybody has asked a question. So either I'm operating it wrong or else nobody's asked a question. But uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, by the way, after this, if you don't have, if there's something that I left off, uh, please just go to zoe.org and on zoe.org you'll see all of the links to where you can get to Slack channels and mailing lists and um, we all hang out on those. So if you need any help, YouTube is great. If you go to YouTube, there's some phenomenal videos. Um, if you go to Zoe, there's a click to the documentation. The documentation is very, very useful as well. Um, and uh, if you can't find what you're looking for, um, just please go ahead. Okay. So I have a question. As an old system programmer, how to get involved. So we love system programmers, and I'm sorry if I appeared at all sort of ageist. I'm kind of old myself, you know, haven't got much hair on the top of my head. Um, so uh, basically go to zoe.org, and I really, really enjoy working with uh, experienced mainframers. When we first released Zoe, we had a lot of issues where we weren't using SAF keyrings correctly, and there were certain issues to do with ZOS security that we didn't understand. We didn't have a chapter on uh, workload management, um, WLM, and all of those were actually contributed by experienced people. Um, so great question. But basically, go to zoe.org, and I think we even have a link on there called getting involved or getting started. Uh, I've got another question. I'm new to this, but I'm a network engineer. I love mainframes. How to get started. Again, the same thing. Go to zoe.org. This Slack workspace, probably all of us, If you, I mean, I tend to drown in emails. I, when email first came, I was I used to live in emails. Now I live in Slack, I'll be honest. I, I live in Slack. I find it much more easier. So not everybody has Slack, and apologies for that. But there is a client for your phone uh, if your laptop is an enterprise laptop and they, and they don't allow you to deploy it. You can also run it in a browser as well. Um, but Slack is, is the place to go to. And if you can't get to Slack, um, 
Open Mainframe Project is on is on LinkedIn. It's on Twitter, so you can reach out to people there. And there's some great discussions going on there. Um, the other thing I just wanted, just very quickly, my last point. One of the problems with the mainframe is sometimes it's chicken and egg. Is that if you want to get involved with the mainframe, you have to be hired by a company that's got a mainframe before you can log on to the mainframe. Because it, you know they're, they're sort of, kind of big, big computers, like we said. I mean, big, you know, credit card. I know probably the world's largest credit company. I think it's only got like two mainframes. Um, but then sticking the next thing, because then how do you become a mainframer? So if you go to zoe.org, you'll find out you can get access to a mainframe. So there's a, that Cobalt training course I talked about b beforehand. If you join that, which is on the link for zoe.org or Cobalt training course, uh, you will get your own access to a, a mainframe virtual machine, which is your own private sandbox. And there's also a link on zoe.org that says, I want, I want to have access. And you'll get, it's called Z trial. So it's running in the public cloud. You're given your own credentials. Uh, the first thing you're going to do when you log on is change it. It'll insist you change your password. It's not shared with anybody else. All information you upload onto there. Even the people running the systems can't see what you're doing with it. So you can basically, you knock yourself out at your own sandbox. But obviously, you have to keep renewing it because it does require com some computing resources. You can, And then after a while, if you're not using it, they're going to recycle it. So you can get your own mainframe to basically kick around the block. Awesome. I'm one minute over time, so I'm just going to wrap up and uh, let you all have the rest of your rest of your Monday back. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. All right. Take care.